I've got nothing to do with the abduction of James Lavis. And I've got the backing of the Lavis family, relations, everybody. Jamie Aaron Lavis was born on the 16th of March 1989. The fact that Jamie was born a healthy little boy was just short of a miracle. Jamie was in fact one of twins, but sadly his brother was lost in utero. He was in many ways a typical young lad, described by his mother as being cheeky, funny, and as making everyone happy. He was well known and liked in the local community, and he enjoyed spending time outside with his older brother, John. The Lavis family are from the suburb of Openshaw in Greater Manchester. It is a working class area near the centre of the city. While at the time the suburb was considered a little rough, it was common for children to be playing out in the streets most days. Jamie was known for being mischievous, playful and boisterous, and in an interview with a local news station, his mother Karen recounted how he would have breakfast with his father John at 6am after the hard-working man had gotten in from his night shift and then go on to win a second helping. He'd simply tell her that he hadn't eaten yet. She lovingly called him comical, a proper character. His sister described him as cute and sweet with a smile that melted people's hearts. Jamie was one of five children and despite his endless energy, he never strayed too far. For instance, as he was afraid of the dark, he was always home by tea time. However, on May the 5th, 1997, which was a national bank holiday, Jamie strangely failed to return home for tea. It was a particularly grey and wet day and his mother was immediately alarmed. She knew that her boy would never come home late, and he loved his food. Jamie's father arrived home a few hours later and he was initially reluctant to panic. He tried to keep his wife calm, claiming she was being overly sensitive, but by the time 9pm and then 10pm rolled around, the whole family knew that something was very, very wrong. They all went out looking for him. They felt especially concerned because Jamie was pretty small. Although he was 8 years old at the time, his clothing size was age 5 to 6 and he was only 4 foot tall. Remember, he was one of twins. His family worried that he was too small to defend himself against other kids, let alone anyone bigger. The Lavis family searched for hours, but Jamie was nowhere to be found. The seeds of concern grew quickly into a huge, dark, imposing fear. So eventually, they called the police. And so unfolded one of the more disturbing cases in Manchester's long history. Neighbourhood search parties took to the streets, and very soon local news shows were involved. The Lavis family begged for Jamie's safe return. If anybody out there knows where Jamie is or he's giving him food, please just get in touch with the police. Everybody's waiting for him to come home. Now, Jamie's described as being small for his age. He's about four foot tall and he wears, he wears clothes that are made to fit a five to six year old. Multiple tips and sightings started flooding in. Several people said they had seen Jamie catching the 219 bus that morning. He was apparently off to town to buy his mother a birthday present. Superintendent Roy Rainford, now retired, was the senior investigator on Jamie's case. He described the 219 bus route as one that Jamie often took, jumping aboard as he got up to his many little adventures. This made the Openshaw buses the first hotspot of the investigation. The particular bus route stopped near several derelict houses that children used to play in. This concerned Rainford because it meant there were many abandoned buildings to search through and that there were ample empty spaces to hide something nefarious. CCTV footage showed that Jamie had in fact entered the bus station at around 10.30am that morning, but this was the last footage that they could find. It was almost as if from the bus station, Jamie vanished into thin air. The hours rolled on. The investigation seemed to be leading nowhere. The Lavis family were becoming more and more distraught. Until a glimmer of hope. 
Around 24 hours after Jamie's disappearance, a local bus driver approached the family. He informed them that Jamie had been on his bus the day that he went missing. He even confirmed that Jamie was wearing a dark blue Reebok tracksuit. And, grateful for the first lead of the case, the family felt that this man could be the key to bringing Jamie home. Darren Vickers, a 28-year-old bus driver, was the last person to see Jamie before he vanished in May of 1997. Darren only lived a few houses down from the Lavis family, and he told the police that Jamie had spent all day on his bus the day that he went missing. He also said that Jamie had purchased a day saver ticket, a ticket that gives you unlimited travel within a certain area, and that he eventually got off at the Ashton bus station near their home. The family were frantic and desperate for answers, and Darren was the closest tie they had to their missing son. Soon, Darren began integrating himself into the family's lives, spending days on end in their home to help with the investigation. He claimed that he felt guilty, having been the last point of contact with Jamie. He felt that he had a responsibility to the family and to Jamie, so the Lavis family embraced him as a good Samaritan, as someone who was both willing and able to help them when they needed it the most. Darren also started to talk to the media. He gave several interviews with local news stations. He stated that whoever was keeping a boy of that age was sick and that they needed to send him home. He also told the media that, unlike the police, he did not believe that Jamie was no longer alive. There's somebody out there has got to be sick keeping a child of that age. You know, it shouldn't be done. If they had any respect, they'd just hand him over to the nearest police station. Just let the child go in. Just let him come home. He's not in trouble. He's not nothing. He's just wanted. I feel he's still alive. I don't fear the same way the police fear that he's murdered. His family don't. But somebody somewhere knows where Jamie is. Could never dream of it. A young child on the bus like that, you know, just going missing. It's just unbearable to think about. It's just a nightmare for everyone. We just got close. It's like one big close family now because we've been out, we've been out virtually 24 hours a day. All of us involved looking for Jamie. He even took part in a police reconstruction of the day that Jamie went missing. Darren now acted as the unofficial spokesperson when the family couldn't face the media. One officer even described him ominously as their kingpin. He began thinking of himself as their pillar of strength. He would lead search parties looking for the boy. The family soon became emotionally dependent on Darren. The more he placed himself at the centre of the case, the more unnerved people around the family became. Community members found his new fixation odd, and soon the police became suspicious as well. It also became increasingly difficult for the police to share information and updates with the family, that is, without it quickly filtering through to Darren. Some officers felt that the Lavis family trusted Darren more than they trusted the police. And who could blame them? Darren had moved in with the family, even though he had his own family just a few doors down. Despite the police's frustrations and their suspicions, they had no evidence or strong leads, and the case seemed to reach a deadlock. However, slowly... Witness accounts of Jamie's last day started trickling in from people on the bus, and all of them varied starkly from Darren's story. He had described Jamie as just another passenger on the bus. However, several other eyewitness accounts said that this was simply not true. Jamie was described as having turned the bus into a playground. He was collecting tickets and changing the gears of the bus. Police also noted that a lone child couldn't purchase a day saver ticket, and due to these mounting holes in the story, Darren now became the prime suspect. Investigators started pouring through hours of CCTV footage, and it was then they discovered something unsettling. While it was true that Jamie arrived at the bus station that morning at around 10.30am, he didn't simply get on a bus. Rather, Jamie was approached by a man who can be seen ruffling his hair. And that man in the footage was... Darren Vickers. 
The police immediately ran a background check on Darren. They discovered at the time of Jamie's disappearance, he had only been working as a bus driver for a few days. On his CV, most of his references were simply fake and he had made them up, except for one. And that one person was a convicted pedophile. With their new discoveries backing their investigation, the police were able to arrest Darren Vickers on the 24th of May 1997. This was approximately three weeks from Jamie's disappearance. Shockingly, the Lavis family were appalled by the arrest. They blamed the police as being desperate and having no other leads. They still felt that Darren was their friend, and maybe more than that, to them, he had been their hero throughout this emotional trauma. And perhaps Jamie's family did actually have a point. The evidence against Darren was, in reality, pretty weak. And so police were unable to charge him. Darren was released. He was welcomed home and fully embraced once again by the Lavis family. Not only were they waiting for him at the station when he was released, but they even threw him a party. Backed by the family's strong support, Darren's confidence escalated. He now even called into a local Manchester radio station to discuss the case. And again, he stated that he believed Jamie was still alive, and that if he weren't, they would have found his body by now. Well, I was coming back from Manchester, and I said to him that uh, I'm going to have to start you back off now, because this is my last run up. Jamie turned around and said to me, but my mum and dad's not in, I've got nowhere to go. Then I said to him, well, since I only live around the corner from me, I can take you back to the depot and drop you off when I go home. He was over the moon about it. He said, yeah. I said, are you sure you're going to be OK? He said, yeah. That was the last we saw of him. So how's the police investigation going, Darren? The police are not letting much information out about that. Which the family is supposed to know, you know, the first confirmed sighting. Yeah. We've never been told. I'll never know till the day he comes home. Mm. I still believe he's alive. If the case was what the police are making out to be, if the case was he was dead, round where they're lucky, they'd have found him, you know. Darren's behaviour was starting to rouse suspicion from those close to the case, but still seemingly not with Karen or John. Darren then shockingly invited a camera crew into the Lavis family's home. This was all an attempt to clear his name. In the clips, he can be seen explicitly stating, I've got nothing to do with the abduction of James Lavis. I've got the backing of the Lavis family, relations, everybody. And so the investigation rolled frustratingly on. I've got nothing to do with the abduction of James Lavis. And I've got the backing of the Lavis family, relations, everybody. In a stroke of luck, a few months later, Darren Vickers was arrested for outstanding driving offences and kept in prison for 10 weeks. This finally gave the police time to focus on the investigation without Darren's interference. Jamie's family can now be spoken to by the police in peace. Perhaps this distance would generate some new information. And it did. Before his arrest, Darren would take Jamie's older brother, John Jr., on day trips on several bus routes. Since John Jr. and Jamie were similar sizes and close in age, police came to believe that Darren was trying to elicit false sightings, confusing the case even further and putting distance between himself and Jamie. Darren had also used the scanner to track police reports. He would show up at possible sightings with Jamie's mother. This behaviour was disruptive, to say the least. Most importantly at this time, with Darren in jail, the police could access the Lavis family free from Darren's manipulative hold. At this time, the Lavis family started to reconsider their relationship with Darren. And by October, the police finally had enough circumstantial evidence, along with the family's new backing, to arrest and charge Darren Vickers with the abduction of Jamie Lavis. Still though, investigators were determined to charge Darren with murder as well. Even though he was already under arrest, they continued the frantic search for Jamie's body. It was now that they received several tips that Darren had been to a particular part of a park called Reddish Vale. And shockingly, not only had Darren been to the park, but according to Sergeant Rainford, he had brought several children to the park at midnight. 
These children recognised Darren from the media appearances that he had placed himself in, and they then went to the police. The children said that Darren showed them a picture of Jamie. He then pointed whilst claiming to see him. This understandably scared the children, and they ran away, frightened. It was also reported that Darren brought Jamie's older brother John Jr. to the same spot in the park. He then gave him a cigarette and told him, This is where your Jamie is, and if you don't behave yourself, I'll throw you in. Finally, near to where Darren had brought the children and Jamie's own brother, situated in a dense and overgrown part of the park, just off of the footpath, police found an item of children's clothing. It was the tracksuit bottoms that Jamie had been wearing on the day that he went missing. Investigators took the clothing for forensic testing and, carefully wrapped inside an item of clothing, they found a small jawbone. Other bones were found scattered around the park. DNA testing of milk teeth proved that the remains did belong to Jamie Lavis. Darren was now charged with abduction and murder. Police believe that after his shift, Darren lured Jamie into his car. He then violated him and ended his short time on this earth. Darren pled not guilty. During the trial, he claimed that Jamie's father was in fact the murderer and that he himself was having an affair with Jamie's mother Karen and that she was carrying his child. Karen was indeed pregnant at the time. She was forced to take a blood test to prove that the baby was not fathered by Darren. Darren's defence was, it turns out, totally fabricated. He was unanimously found guilty. Darren Vickers was charged to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. But even still, his vile manipulation and fascination with the media knew no bounds. He now confessed to the murder and violation of Jamie Lavis. However, he then contacted the media just a few days later and publicly retracted his confession. Several officers that worked on the case believed that Darren Vickers would have gone on to become a serial killer were he not imprisoned. Darren was up for parole in 2023, but he was thankfully refused. Tragically, Jamie's older brother, John Jr., ended his own time on this earth at age 31. The Lavis family think of Jamie every day, and Mother Karen still writes poems about her son to this very day. 